uh, a small but very uh, select and defined and the group. select okay no worries right so considering the amount of people here questions at any point then don't worry just button and we'll go through so as most of you know me anyway but i thought i, I was going to give just a potted history of, of who i am and it was a. Uh, so I've worked in conservation for 30 years now. So basically as a contractor, uh, consultant, but primarily working for sort of Natural England and its legacy bodies for the last 25 years. So covering, as I said, agri-environment for the sort of start of my career for sort of 20 years. And then for the, and managing the, the, the teams for Natural England in sort of Avon and, and Wiltshire, um, and sometimes Somerset. And the last few years I've been working on the SSSI programme, so sites of special scientific interest and linked mainly to the 25-year environment plan targets, which sort of inform the um, the uh, um, our current environment act. Um, so what I was going to run through, and like I say, chipping at any time, was it's annoying. Um, was oh where was I there we go uh was just sort of going through the sort of environment act and the political drivers and the rhetoric behind it um what it might mean for us in the area in the parish um Brem Hill um Hill Martin uh Calma Eight Chippenham all the sort of parishes associated with, with the uh Marden and the Avon um the ecological, some of the ecological components. Um, and I was going to focus on what we've been doing in Bremhill uh, for the last three, four years, or not, as the case may be. Um, oh, so, um, so, yeah, so the political drivers. This was some time ago, pre pre COVID, and we started working and informing the the twenty five year environment plan, which going which was then got, which was then translated into the Environment Act, published in November two thousand and twenty one. So Natural England and other organisations had teams working on this, contributing to it, but it's taken rather a long time to sort of come to fruition. Um, and at a regional level, so Wiltshire Council um, embedded some of the, the nature recover strategy elements into the, the networks for green and blue spaces. And that the the picture to the right is sort of showing so, you know, the area around Rankan and the corridors uh, linked to sort of um, to blue bean river and green sort of hedge networks or habitat networks. Um, so the, the, these have been identified and Wiltshire Council had, had, um, had started moving forward with this. Um, but like I sort of said previously, the um, no action could actually be undertaken without the Environment Act and its associated targets. Now, these targets have now finally been released. They were published in the Environmental Improvement Plan in December 2023. Um, it highlights the sort of the key delivery against the 25 year goals. So the goals will take us up to 2042. So you can probably work out that the plan started what a few years ago, but hasn't really moved forward. Um, we've got a a lot of sort of interim targets which they've they've given us for 2028 which lots of organizations have been involved in so you know primarily the defra organization so natural england the environment agency forestry commission um and other sort of engos which are the environmental non-governmental organizations the water companies quite a few other organizations um along it um there's a much stronger focus on the governance and monitoring and evaluation of the targets. So, so currently we'd report sort of every year, um, we'll be working towards a natural England, we'll be working for some of the aspects, particularly relating to actually my target, which is very specific to triple SIs. And so we'll be reporting on a monthly basis 
on progress and where we're moving to. But the whole thing is, is quite complicated. And I'm not going into the detail of the Improvement Plan or the, the Environment Act, but it sort of covers a huge aspect of what everybody does, sort of from green finance, green jobs, um, green and government commitments, making green choices, the new farming schemes which have come out and the sort of biodiversity net gain linked to planning, which um, you may or may not be aware of. But, you know, hopefully you um, you could ask questions if you don't. Um, so nature recovery. And like I said, we've been waiting for a while for this, but it's it's the nature recovery, nature recovery strategies. It's, it's meant to be a sort of bottom up approach coming from um from us must that are involved on the call from councils um and probably the ownership would involve um locally will be down to sort of Wiltshire County Councils leading on this um or providing funding and sort of coming up with more strategic um more strategic funding plans. Um like I said, it's a bottom up approach and it's really about understanding our environment understanding the opportunities, understanding the solutions and working together, of which hopefully a lot of people on this call are already involved in. Um, so underpinning nature recovery, there's there will be local nature recovery strategies or that, and that's what Wiltshire Council should be standing on over. Um, my feeling is it doesn't have to be just down to them. It's, it, it's down to us because we want to do um we want to do what's right um um as i said the there's been people in post natural england have developed there's about five pilots which started about three years ago so the outcomes of the pilots have sort of been shared um you can get to it on gov.uk and i can sort of provide links later on but we couldn't do we couldn't go any further um Although they all made common sense and things were, were, were tested, things were working, not work, were not working. We couldn't actually fund anything further than the pilots. Um, we've got people in place within Natural England nationally. Um, I'm more of an, in the delivery aspect. So um, there'll be, I'm whilst I work in a national team, we'll have... Um, nature recovery staff then moving into the national delivery teams and there's already teams um, embedded in the local Wiltshire team so there's specific staff senior advisors and delivery staff who will work closely with Wiltshire Council to help develop strategies and, and push out nature recovery to the wider population. Um, realistically some of us are already doing it. I already started moving forward with this about three years ago, post COVID, and then COVID sort of brought a halt to it. So it's my only bit of volunteering. I've only been paid to deliver conservation, which isn't brilliant, really, when I should be doing it because it's what I believe in and it's happening in my own parish. Um, so we're already doing things. There's a lot of organisations out there. Yourselves involved in Friends of the River Marden and etc. Um, there's also a lot of tools out there to help to enable us to um, develop strategy and understanding our our shared objectives a bit more. So yeah, um, people can be quite polarised or quite focused on a particular specialism or idea or concern. Um, but the, the sort of recovery strategies around trying to work across all of them and trying to pull something together. Um, Wiltshire Council developed a nature recovery strategy tool, which was funded by um, Natural England, actually, who had seed cord funding, um, and the tool's very good. But it provides you with you know, a brief framework for how you might sort of tackle developing a strategy. So um, we've got, again, Natural England hosts it. It's uh, this magic map, which has all the data layers for the land-based schemes or the priority habitats, the designation. So all that information is in, in in one place. And, you know, so you can overlay the various bits of data to give yourself an idea of what you might have in a given geographical space. Um, there's recent 
um, applications designed to help farmers, um, something called Land App, which is, I think, fairly cheap. But it also pulls all these data sets down and enables individuals, organisations, farmers to, to do their own mapping in a very simple, straightforward way. So you can start collaborating with, with whomever to then start developing a strategy. Um, linked to that, Natural England have actually linked to habitats, particularly there's a um, Natural England. I'm not, this isn't a Natural England promotion thing. It's just that's what we get paid to do. And I happen to work for them. But um, um, Natural England have host a, an ecological network. Um, um, I don't know if I've got it up here, actually. Let's see. I know. I've got a natural, I've got, so it helps you identify ecological networks. I think I've got a slide later. Uh, linking on to that so where you've got habitats where you can link to them and where the best opportunities are for enhancing connecting and developing networks so you can it's very much it's much more simpler to share these things on a, on a map or a picture rather than um, a spreadsheet um, so one of the things around the data the data isn't always correct so particularly around habitat, priority habitats, things change over time, the condition of a habitat changes. Um, part of the thing around, I think, around nature recovery, nature recovery strategies are engaging with whomever, everybody that we know, um, from ecologists to, to volunteers on the ground, mapping what we might have and validating the habitats and species which, which are there. Um, um, start mapping it and developing a strategy. Um, I've got a question there. Do we have to wait? Um, are we kicking the can down the road, as Robert asked the other day? I don't think we are. I think we've got, um, it's getting prepared for things that are happening, um, but have taken a for a long time to, to weave their way through the various government departments and and get sign off for ministers but um we don't have to wait we can keep going forward making informed decisions on on how we might want to develop in the future um one of the previous so this is talking about species really and, and habitats the martin's got you know it's a reasonable catchment but it covers um, as hopefully you're aware, the chalk to the cheese. So, where we've got quite distinctly different landscapes managed in different ways. So, um, we've got to the the south. We've got you know on the on the downs, the Cheryl Downs, where the the chalk starts. We've got you know really important species such as corn buntings and um, and lapwings. You know that's where their habitats are. That's where they nest. But also, as we go much further to the north, the other side of the catchment, we start approaching sort of the Avon side up towards Bradenstoke, etc. We have also got lapwings. We've got lapwings in the parish of Bremhill, you know, and some are nesting. And we've got, more important, we've got curlew that occur. So there's a wide range of species covering um, a gap in the middle, which could be, you know, if you, if you look at something like marsh fertilities, they occur on Pusey Downs, they occur at Morgan's Hill. Hopefully you know the uh, ge ge geography of the area. But also in the sort of northern uh, northern Wiltshire sort of neutral grasslands, there used to be um, marsh fertilities there. So there's opportunities to link and join up these things. Um, other species which uh, range from sort of in decline to at risk are a vast range of bats that inhabit the area um, that either roost or they've got hybrid, they've got hibernaculars or maternity roosts. So they'll be associated with the Avon, the hedges, the grasslands. They've all got quite distinct um, foraging and um, habitat requirements. So from rough grassland to, like I said, to the hedges, to the river, some feeding on, on small fish. So it's understanding how they use. And you could say they were the keystone species across our landscape, which connect the habitats and the other, other species. Um, yeah, the importance of the habitats, the woodlands, the hedges, the grassland, the water, and the arable. The arable, again, 
Um, we do know there's some rare arable species. You know, without the arable, you won't get the corn buntings and lots of our other rare species. So there's an interaction between everything that we walk through on a daily basis. Um, the benefits of trees in woodland, and I think, yeah, this relates. And I must thank uh, John John Harris. I pinched one of his slides from a recent uh, Bremer Hill Biodiversity slide that trees sequester carbon for improving air quality, habitats for fungi and invertebrates, protection for birds and animals, food for a myriad of, of organisms, helping with natural flood management, public amenity space and visual well-being. I mean, this is, I suppose, trees is one of the reasons why I first sort of joined and started thinking about connectivity and, and working across the parish was because I went to a meeting and somebody said, we want to plant trees everywhere. And it's like, hold on. You've got to be careful. It's right tree, right place. It depends on your species. The last thing you want to do is plant trees where you've got nesting lapwings or you've got already important areas of grassland or other habitats which aren't suited to it. But it's there and it's an understanding of where you can, what you do, and getting the advantage. And I don't know, um, getting the most out of it. So, again, this is a slide from John Harris, which is great. These are the threats that are affecting us. So it's not just the Marden. The Marden catchment, as you're aware, runs right the way through Brent Hill Parish as well as Calm Parish. So um, the biggest threats to us, habitat disturbance, especially threatened species, including water voles, otters, the whole feeding territory um, due to the proximity of new housing, commercial land development. Um, the impact of flooding caused by extreme rainfall due to acknowledged climate change and increase of hard surface runoff. Invasive plant species to the waterways, um, Himalayan balsam, Japanese knotweed. Threats by an expanding population of monk jack, monk jack deer, but also, you know, you've got fallow deer um, up at Bowood. Um, and if the road populations aren't kept in check, the same issues can happen. Um, mink numbers that are affecting fish stocks um the loss of hedgerows and trees on wildlife corridors um consider yeah and that's been a major consideration when evaluating siting of large solar farms which may have occurred recently um commercial and domestic use of pesticides and herbicides um vehicle emissions and lack of funding to help the decline of wildlife and natural habitat as it spirals at an alarming weight rate weight um so yeah those are the threats you'll have you'll know your own threat you know your own area there's 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 more threats than that um opportunities there are opportunities through various um planning link biodiversity gains but um we need to be more sensitive to the land development planning, um, which can also, but that can also create a positive solution for wildlife wildlife recovery without a loss of natural wildlife habitat. But it's also identifying where wildlife recovery could be. Um, improve wildlife well-being through connectivity, um, identifying sites for grassland, neutral meadows, and um, we've got some little, you know, mature areas uh the woodlands um increasing corridors riparian strips which are the um which are the vegetation adjacent to water courses um and the most important things for the rural area of the marden is is supporting farmers developing best practice and giving them the information to sort of make um make the best decisions which to some extent will be linked to funding, but it's giving them the information to make, you know, find the right decisions or a, an informed decision. Um, we've great, got opportunities here to plant sort of upstream of floodplains, chipping and being um, key one in point. Um, and the promoting the health, engaging um, people, education, kids, children i should say families um and everybody sort of um everybody in between um it's also developing your database in citizen science it's you know it's reporting and there's various apps and ways that you can report sightings start thinking about monitoring the habitats that are there 
there's organizations uh, such as the Wilson Parks Canal, um, which you know, they're geared up towards water and they they, they can help develop sort of blue, blue and green corridors. Um, various initiatives, including with BART, about improving the in-stream habitats of rivers. So it's um, a lot of the agro-environment schemes, which farmers have been linked to, are primarily aimed at the wider land management and take often deal with in-river type um, restoration. Um, and visions, a 200 metre wide recovery and protection corridor, both sides of the River Marden and a 100 metre buffer for other key waterways. And I think if I'm right, that's included in some of the um, either parish or Wiltshire Council um, plans. It's in the neighbourhood plan, Roger. It's in the neighbourhood plan, good. Um, for, for, for John Harris and for us. Okay, good. So what I'm going to run through a couple of this is a sort of, a, I suppose it may have been a natural England style, but this is about understanding biodiversity and connectivity. So, ooh, 15 years ago, I started working on developing priority habitat plans for forestry commission and developing areas where they might want to recreate new woodland. And this is around sort of an old uh, modeling type process which was done actually by the Forestry Commission, but they didn't even realise they produced it themselves. And it's a it's developing a way of connecting up, and this is how the, um, the ecological network things are based, and it's about identifying key bits of habitat and the land in between them. Um, so if this, if, the, uh, if this was concrete in between, then you haven't got a great opportunity, but where you've got semi-improved grassland and you want to link unimproved rust and that's a great starting point and you might actually think yeah and it's looking at those different aspects of the habitat that you might cross to set so to recreate species rich grass and which is actually quite a difficult thing to do sometimes um depending on what um what land you're trying to recreate it on but it's it's understanding in a visual way of looking at where you might develop some opportunities for yeah for different species different species move at different rates or move at different rates so it's identifying those those opportunities um so there's lots of words on this slide and it's basically giving a yeah a description of the zonation of um of where you might yeah where you might want to take these opportunities and this will particularly link to possibly link to sort of planning and nature recovery and net gain um where um, planning uh, might leave sort of large developments to sort of investing in um, mitigating developments. Um, so I'll be looking at core areas. So the darker green will be woodland, the lighter green grassland. So it's looking across a much wider landscape and where you've got sort of the opportunities to make, make big wins. Um, all this is available on Magic Mac and Land App and all the various um, Exactly. So everything we do, that we do within Natural England is shared pretty much straight away with everybody. Um, and it's out there for the, the local population. Well, I will, I'm quite happy to take questions at the moment before I move on to sort of the Brem Hill um, aspect of this. Roger, I've got a couple of questions, if I if I may. And thank you very yeah. much for the, the presentation so far. The first is in terms of you, you set out the opportunities. I know it's quite a long and extensive list, so you might just want to pick one or two, but what are the barriers? What are the reasons that we may not be able to achieve those, achieve those opportunities? So we're in a, a rural landscape. So, yeah, and a lot of what we've got, yeah, where the connectivity exists is within farmland. So a farm is a business which may have been, um, which is de developed over hundreds of years, perhaps. Um, so you could say, right, we need to introduce sheep grazing or stop sheep grazing or introduce cattle, stop far intensively farming this bit of land. And you've got to think that actually it may not be, it may not be possible. You can't just stop a, a major business um, from carrying on. You've got barriers from, I suppose, the opportunities, um, are linked to funding quite often and it's the prioritizing of funding to certain um areas of activity 
um, I suppose. Um, so if I picked through each of those, I could come up with an answer. Opportunity for woodland. We've got Ash Dye back and it's looking at the best thing to do there. I mean, it's all right planting woodlands, but even these trees need substantial funding to, to deliver that. Um, at, at this moment in time, I don't think uh, perhaps that that planting woodland is provides the financial incentive um, for farmers to, um, to take this on. Uh, so yes, yeah, a myriad of things, and it's like some things. It may be an it may not be an opportunity tomorrow, but it may be opportunity a year or two years time. And for me, it's actually trying to get a really good picture of what you've got, and you know as a farm changes ownership, then you think actually we can then introduce the idea and, and, and things change. So there are barriers, but not necessarily insurmountable. Tara. Um, Tara. Yeah, I oh. just to respond to the, the tree planting thing, and then I've got a question. Um, it, it is a barrier the cost and obviously for a, a landowner it affects the value of their land if they put trees on it and um, we recognize that so um although there's quite healthy incentives to plant trees um that the grants i think run out after 15 years um so really um landowners are more likely to plant trees if it's not just about the money for them it's because they want to think about future generations and, and maybe they've got a, a part of a field that they, they're prepared to, you know, sacrifice in a way in, in terms of finance uh, to put trees on. And and even these trees does work. Not only does it, do we try to acquire land to plant trees on, we've also got a partnership project now and, and hopefully we'll have more where why we planted trees on, on landowners land. So they've retained the ownership. Um. So and my, my question was about the Wiltshire, um, nature recovery tool she mentioned is that something that's available for everyone yeah it is um and basically the tool actually is just um a link to describing what nature recovery is and and, and giving the link to various sites which provide you the um um provide the data sets um it so is like available yeah, such as Magic Map, such as the network stuff. There's a there was a meeting. It was piloted in with Calm Without. So Robert, were you there at the meetings when they were? I was. What to... Yes, yes, I was. And and that was about trying to ask people to start ground truthing. How you um, how you might want to go about ground truthing, um what was there on the on the uh, on the various data sets it's a bit the meeting was a bit chaotic i think and not um and whether that will be rolled out so we can engage across and actually work out with the plan and come up with a a neighborhood plan which is wedded to a to a local nature recovery strategy but i think this is going to evolve over the next year um but realistically in brem hill we've all we can already access these things and understand how it all works. So that's something we can move forward to. And if people want to go through in more detail the various tools available, then I think I'm more than happy to sort of set things up and just go through all the various. Some of them are rather complicated and give you rather more information than you might want, really. But Robert, you've got a specific question, have you? I have, yes. Um, oh, dear, you've disappeared. Have I? What's oh? There you go. I can see. Uh, two two things, Roger. Uh, the plans that you're talking about. This is going to evolve slowly over a, a series of years. This is not for next year. So these interlocking systems that you talk about on, on on governmental level down to local level, through to getting money through to farmers is this is not tomorrow. And, and I suppose I'm trying to address my own. Uh, Concerns about kicking the can down the road, as as, as you know, I mentioned at a, in a previous meeting. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so friends of Martin Valley, we um, we've noticed that we a place where we have we normally see brown trout. The brown trout disappeared. 
And that's caused alarm amongst ourselves. It's in Quemerford, down by Quemerford Bridge. And so we're contemplating the idea of buying a fairly expensive bit of kit to do water monitoring ourselves. We've received the the information from the EA, where the EA, for example, are cutting back on their monitoring. Um, there was an area called the Abba Brook we were particularly interested in. The EA last did surveys there in 2017. And so they're cutting back. And so, if you like, in, in, in easy easy terms, citizen science has to fill the gap and and take it on. We're thinking of buying this expensive bit of equipment, which is about six thousand pounds, and finding ways to fund that. And we would be mapping, if you like, you, you talk about ground mapping. We'd be uh, water mapping um, the, the Marden Valley from Calston down to Blackbridge. Um, once we have that information. Where do we point it to and how does that become um, shameless for action and for doing? Well, <laughs> sorry, I had a cough for a couple of weeks, so I will. Um, so, A, there's the Bristol Catchment Partnership. Yep. Okay, um, which Bart will be involved in. And they've got a funding. They do. They're open for funding at the moment. I think. Yeah, we're, like we're, to... we're applying, Roger, for something else, yeah. Okay, so can they do it through that? And we, we, I think we can get the toys. How do we use the information? I don't know. Um, what? I don't know, to be honest. Um, who do we? So have you spoken to? So whether you go EA, I suppose they won't be ready to use. Yeah, you know, depending on the information and what it relates to. I mean, is it? and what's causing the issue. Um, it'll be EA up there, won't it, rather than Wessex? It's EA, yeah, they're, they're the dominant force, yeah. So I think it, it will feed back to the Bristol Catchment Partnership, which the Wildlife Trust are members of, which you've okay. got the EA, you've got Wessex and Bar a part of, and I think it's, looking, it's discussing with them and asking them the question, where are, where are we going? with it i i think it'd be good to do the whole of the marden really and go for a big scale yeah um, we were happy to do that roger okay good because i think that's what um certainly from our perspective it's going to be quite important what's important is a is develop it's going to be important in developing the baseline as well as trying to work out what the issue is and trying to work out actually if we put this intervention in and it could well be that an intervention goes in at point a b c wherever um if we can monitor the improvement to the to the water quality and this increase in species then that's going to be quite important evidence now um and there could be wider funding streams available to to improve this through wessex but i i don't know at this point but these are the sorts of things i think you start pulling together and thinking right this is where the threat is this is the opportunity what can we do about it but how do we do it well and it sort of goes on to my how do we do it collectively and who takes ownership for it um because at the moment we're work, you're all working really well across different through and through just using the few friends of the river mark and we've got the farmer facilitation group it's just like bringing all that together and trying to work holistically across a much bigger area um and that's what i think i'd like probably covering it and then is that's what we want to identify and start looking at who does what where when how and who do we go to Okay, thank you. I've already emailed Simon Bart about it, and he hadn't had a reply yet. But he's usually pretty good. Um, yeah, I emailed him just just before this presentation, actually. Um, right. Oh, I know why that's not. Oh. Um, right. Okay. Um, moving on to Bremhill now. Um, Originally, yeah, the idea came around around, or I first started thinking about a local nature recovery strategy. And as far as, yeah, World Youth Council was concerned, I was quite keen to get going as soon as possible to the extent 
I was going to be funded to sort of produce the draft toolkit, but then there was a slight conflict of interest for some reason. Um, so what I started doing was engaging with with Brem Zero, which is um, really focused on Brem Hill, parish of Brem Hill, but it's looking at you know, zero carbon and the links to the environment. And that was sort of our first meeting was about three years ago. Um, on the back of that, I sort of took the lead on the environmental side and started to sort of start working, um, developing a brief local nature recovery strategy. And like I say, sort of COVID sort of um, put a bit of a stop to that. So, but last year I started sort of getting more traction, started forming a steering group um, and the steering group took control and we started developing a, a farmer group uh, and then working towards facilitation and sort of I'll run through facilitation in greater detail in a bit. Um, we had a few guided walks, which were really good. Um, so we had two walks along Ed Jones's land next to the, the River Marden, which is um, with some incredibly species rich grassland. Um, uh, the MG5 neutral meadows. Um, cut for hay meadows, which we would have probably typically seen along the Marden going all the way down to um, to Chippenham. Um, completely different to the um, less species rich than the the chalk grassland on the on the chalk, um, but um, yeah, incredible sort of number of species that. Um, uh, James I walked up to the triple side to see the grass in there, and then we did. Nick Adams hosted a um, a a bird walk up at um, Spurt Hill, which was yeah, which was really well attended. It was absolutely brilliant. So that really sort of got some traction with with local people. So there's a combination of farmers and 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 individuals. So that's a great day. Um, so also started looking at. Um, invasive species um along the river along the carriage brook which runs along brem hill um and i did a walk along there and discovered there's rather a lot more there than anticipated and it wasn't a one-man band putting it out and you know which has yeah affects the marden so um clearing invasive species from the marden really starts at the top at hill martin working down otherwise you, you're wasting time um so um that was last year as we start moving forward um we've got a possible we've got a facilitation funding um application at the moment or we i say we i'm 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 on the steering group but um we've got incredibly powerful steering group which is sort of steering things forward um initially it was just going to focus on on brem hill um so what the facilitation funding is, it's about providing funding for a, a, a one-to-many type approach where you bring together a group of farmers and providing events, um, doing all the administration, which and the events are linked to key aspects of uh, linked to the um, your natural character areas. So defined within countryside stewardship, which is the sort of primary funding for farmers to to do beneficial environmental activities. So within it, there's some key objectives. Um, so the key ones for for Brem Hill or the area was water quality, air quality, water management, priority of habitat, biodiversity and priority species, diversity and abundance. So it's covering quite a lot. The, um, the area in Brown, um, near Chalka is Brem Hill. The actual facilitation fund area now is expanded to the red boundary. So right over towards Sutton Benga, down nearly to Chippenham, up towards Braden, <laughs> Stoke and Bushton. So very much the major part of the sort of cheese catchment which flows into the Avon. So we'll, we've brought together 43 farmers and, oh gosh, I can't remember now, Tara, was it three and a half thousand, about three and a half thousand hectares. So what a significant area of land. And what's quite encouraging are quite often those farms are contiguous. So they're not isolated. You're actually may have in the future, um, if we can all work the same way, um, or they 
have a shared set of objectives that we can really make a difference on the wildlife corridors and um, expanding and, impl and um, protecting the habitats associated with the, with the catchment. Um, oh, the other thing is, um, is, as I've mentioned, the invasive species identification and eradication. That's something that we're quite keen on looking at. Um, on the right, my right, your right, um, is Himalayan balsam, which is, you yeah, know, there are stands as dense as this in parts of the Cowage Brook. Um, <coughs> I don't know if you recognise the, um, the invasive species on the left, but that's um, a signal crayfish, which is a, which was captured in the Cowage Brook. Um, and in the middle, that's a, that Spanish bluebell. So again, there's a sort of myriad of species around about the place. So it's uh, identifying them and then trying to work out ways to eradicate them. So that's what we'll be working on the next few years. Um, and Robert and others will be joining me in surveying the Himalayan balsam along the Cowage Brook and then coming up with a cunning or not so cunning plan. Um, what we, you know, look at in just extent just to Bren Hill, it, it's, you know, nature recovers about engaging everybody. Um, I didn't organise this. This is someone local who, who um, they were looking at the, the carriage and looking at trapping um, invertebrates, looking at fish, fish species along the carriage, which I didn't think there was many in because it's quite fleet, free flowing and tends to sort of clean out most of the time, clean whatever species of right there most of the time so what we want to start doing is trying to set up events where we can engage with more than just the um the retired um middle class individuals that are the sort of typical interest groups for biodiversity and conservation so it's really trying to expand in the in the village taking opportunities to engage sort of multi-generationally and actually start developing skills around what what might float people's boats, their personal interest, and, and what we need to do. I think you're much further ahead than us in the parish, perhaps on uh, with Friends of the Mid River Marvin. So we're a bit further behind in that aspect. So I think it's it's working together, learning from from each of our experiences and, and pooling the best resources. That's a slide again from John about who's operating in the area. Rem Zero, I mentioned, um, which, which is looking at a lot more than just biodiversity. I mean, it's looking and nature recovery isn't just about the biodiversity. It's the wider things that impact on nature. Wiltshire and Barts Canal Trust, the River Warriors, Friends of the River Marvin, uh, Mr. Laban Rivers Trust, um, who are a charity organisation, Avon These Trees, Bram Hill Parish, Parish Council, and the Bren Hill Vale Farmers Group, who haven't quite got a logo yet, but um, I'm sure that one's under development. So, yeah, the question that affects us in the parish of Bremel, nothing, the parish of, ben, back, of Bremel has a boundary, um, habitat speak. Sorry, Tara, I'll just pause quickly there for you to ask your question. I wonder, it was a shameless plug actually for Avon these trees and because you meant, mentioned multi generation engagement, um, Avon these trees are trying to do that um as much as we can and we've got a loads of events coming up, so please encourage um all 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 everyone you can think of families etc to get involved and, and sign up to our events which are all free, um so we've got um forest schools we've got Hayes Fest coming up where there'll be activities for children. Um, well-being days, um, pollinator event, um, uh, a foraging event. So, yeah, I think that, you know, try, trying to appeal to as many people as possible, not just, as you say, the uh, the retirees. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think, so I, speaking to Robert, you know, the things that you do with the Friends of the River Marden, trying to develop things from scratch and... <laughs> In Bremhill, like I said, the, the boundaries of our respective parishes around our barriers to the species and the habitats. And 
And I think the local nature of recovery, local nature of the strategies give us gives us an opportunity to find an umbrella to, to cover a lot more. Um and if we can really sort of engage with the farmers and, and support them in, in making the right decisions for us, for them, informed decisions based on you know best available data and the opportunities available to people. So working as individuals, um, so working over for the, you trying to get, you know, the Friends of the River Mile getting funding for one um, one monitoring station where the likes of Wessex and they're trying to engage with as many people as possible. So the Bremhill Fire, they've got 43 farmers they can deal with at once. Whereas if they came into the catchment themselves, they'd have to deal with one to start organising things. That facilitation group, that group of farmers, is already there as an audience. They've signed up. They've got. They've got to have to have uh, a couple of events every single quarter, um, which they should attend. And some of it will link to things like farming infrastructure, sharing machinery, understanding habitats, understanding carbon, understanding biodiversity, net gains, and the opportunities that are there. Um, it's yeah, and then trying to find out the you know you've I've seen the friends of the River Mard and the sort of strategic the um, objectives, and they work. I think they look pretty good. And it's looking at can we look a bit wider than that at the wider catchment because it should it should be fairly um, there's massive synergies there, and it should link to the like I said the right parent steps and grassland recreation there. <laughs> hedgerow planting it's something that you know extends much further than the 200 meters adjacent to the uh the Marden. extends to the the Cader burner the cowage brook which all have the abbot which all have very distinct their own habitat so we won't get water voles on the cowage just because it flows too quickly in spain or just drown the water or old water voles whereas the Cader burner and the Abbot, you've probably got better opportunities for re recreating habitats along there. Um, but I'd sort of, you know, as a just a volunteer, and I'm not part of a parish council, it's like, how can we sort of pull it together? How can people pull it together as a wider strategy and become a, a lot more, more inclusive? Um, and it's, yeah, it's developing people's interest and, and what floats their boats there's a lot of skilled individuals with particular skill sets in the area which sometimes don't want to be part of a, a wider group but be quite happy wandering along with their dog or on their own with their family and can identify um species or habitats and sort of monitor progress and it's about engaging and who's going to take responsibility for that so That's 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 it. So, Roger, thank you very very much indeed. I, again, I'm sure there are more questions. A question about the um, the landowners, the uh, the farmers group. I suppose two questions. One is how not these things are ever easy, but how easy it was to, to bring those landowners together. And two, under what auspices is, is it under Natural England or is it under the parish council? I'm just wanting to understand what the, the mechanism yeah. was that brought people together. So basically, uh, although it's in our biodiversity report, I went out on my own, really. Um, although I checked in with the parish council and said, look, I'm doing this. And oh, John Harris and Isabel <laughs> McCall and sort of ran through what I was doing and trying to link things together. The initial concept of, um, I suppose, I had a refresh of the nature recovery strategy type approach with a, a Brem Zero meeting, which a couple of, so um, Victoria and I and Jill Jones, sort of local farmers, John Satchel, so a few farmers. And yeah, so four or five farmers attended that meeting and then it was right, okay, we want to make a difference. What do we do and how do we get it together? Steering group formed and it went from, from there. Now, I think the, the success of the steering group was I didn't lead it. The success of it was the um I provided guidance, which I've done in the past with it. So my 
um, interaction with steering with um, facilitation group goes back 10 or 15 years and I worked for the government and the approach was it's not up to me to tell you what to do you know you might not trust me I work for essentially DEFRA and Natural England it's not about that I will just give you whatever guidance I've got staff in place that will give you the advice so the, the key thing to do is not to tell landowners what to do it's for them to make the decisions about what interests them um so it's having the farmers engaging with the other farmers yeah. so victoria and i is quite a you know she's very good at um connecting with different people um the it's engaging with a good facilitator to simon sparks being facility facilitates the pusey downs group um when we had a meeting with the farmers it soon it was soon clear that everybody needs si lots new simon so within your steering group somebody trusted somebody who knew they could do the right thing and because it was farmers working together one farmer influence was another i took my dog down to the kennels farm there no we're not interested in collaborating i said we've got a meeting no we don't do it we don't do it we just work within our our boundaries they turned up at the meeting and it's like well we haven't seen them for 20 years we did we've never so it's about getting once you get two i think we may have too many but i think it's brilliant absolutely brilliant as we start moving forward with this um it's them incentivizing each other and nobody pushed them into it and it's about sharing experience and the ability to access um um funding in the future and working together so hopefully we'll be successful with the application if not then we'll it will still go forward as a farmer group there's enough of us there to provide the information they might need or they want to make informed decisions and that's the way the agro environment schemes is the basic payment scheme disappears this is this is where part of their funding will come from in the future. Uh, uh, Roger, just quickly, is it, is it scalable in a sense of could we have, or are there groups similar to this dotted around the country? Or are there, is there a well, way of um, scaling? Wiltshire, or... So, yes, yeah, so Wiltshire basically, I think, has 25% of all facilitation funds in the country. So it all started, so Marlborough Downs, was the original nature improvement area so it was a pilot about trying to work in the landscape then it became making space for nature and then then it sort of started then it started kicking up the facilitation groups they have a defined carrying capacity as it were if you have too many it gets very difficult to organize and manage and what you need is what's scalable realistically is the is the common theme around habitats yes. and farming systems so you will have a, a joint interest in things it's not that you can't break off and do your own things but it have it's good if you have a, a, a have shared objectives that everybody everybody can sort of work towards um jill's on the call sitting quietly listening to me now i notice um i don't know if you've got anything to say about it Maybe not. Possibly um, not. <laughs> I think Robert's possibly. got a question, though. Robert. Rob, uh, Robert. Go on, Rob. It's great the work you're doing, Roger. I'm going to ask an impertinent question. You'd have to slap me down if uh, if I've got it wrong. And it's great the work you're doing with Jill, who is on the call but not listening, and Victoria. And, uh, just to push all this thing forward, and the fact you've got 44 correspondents, partners, uh, is, 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 is very, very good. Now, that's all kind of top level uh, that you're dealing with there, Roger. And you know, I'm um, uh, trying to deal with things kind of at the bottom. We're at a bottom up. Yeah. How do you do? And it was in this was in, inferred in the strategy that, in fact, uh, was written <coughs> by um, Jeremy. Um, was how, how do you deal with something like Roundup? Now, Roundup is something that's used by farmers and it's used by gardeners. It's across um the spectrum uh, roundup kills birds kills weeds kills birds 
and kills a lot of invertebrates as well. And we all know that it's um, that it's it's not very good stuff for the environment. So if you're talking about habitats and wildlife, then maybe one of the 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 moving points could be a, a questioning of glycophosphates. But how how does that fit into your perspective? Is that too dangerous, and you keep well away from it, or is that something? No, I mean that's part of the. <laughs> That will be part of the, um, as we go forward, sort of working with pesticides, nutrients, it will be, yeah, it will be, which which will link to water quality at the end of the day, that will be part yeah. of it. So we're not, we can't tell people to stop doing it, but what you can help is that you're providing a forum where it can be discussed and you look at alternatives to doing it. And I think this is like you, you mentioned about the private individuals. It's down to people in the in the gardens and it's a joint effort. You know, it's I suppose why I, I think with legislation and the targets associated with um with the environment um improvement plan and a 25 year targets, the government will take a while to make these decisions. So there'll be political pressures outside of the conservation sector to do certain things so there'll always be a sort of a slightly polarized um, approach to some of these things but that's not to stop us moving forward and developing a strong baseline and a knowledge base and helping to helping people to think whether it's informed decisions for a farmer or for a local individual so i'm 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 really glad that jill and victoria have sort of taken Taking really taking this forward, and it might give me the opportunity to sort of think about how we start working with nature recovery strategies and how do we put it together. But I think rather than Bremhill working on its own, we can look at things like this across a yeah. Um, which so is, practically, would you be doing workshops on Roundup and, and the alternatives, or is that too close to to uh, precise, Roger? Um. I'm not, I can't remember what we've got factored in, to be honest, um, okay. but it'll be part of it um, going forward, but I'm not sure it's to, to So this will be a three-year programme, so it'll be three years, and we've scoped out, and I can't remember what we've got included, but, yeah, pesticides will be part of the conversation. Okay. Because um, the government has said they're not going to do anything about it until 2042, isn't it? Well, that's the, yeah, that's, that's the def science def and actually yeah. doing something about it. So it's very difficult to sit and think legislation or what come around the corner, like you say. It's like, oh, yeah, we need to do something about it. Now the rhetoric around the political rhetoric, um, you know, they've been talking about the Environment Act for five years. When, you know, in that five years, there's been a significant decline already to species, habitat and, and water quality, whereas the information behind it and for the environment is already there. So I think as local individuals, it's now incumbent on us to try and start, or me. Yeah, I agree, Roger, it's down to individuals. We can't, can't rely on the government. And I think just coming up with a local nature recovery strategy, a local one, it doesn't have to be funded. You've got the, the individuals, you can get the buy the neighbourhood plans from from Bremel and from Calm Without have captured lots of the things that um that are common sense and we need to do. So I think it's engaging the parish council, but it's not for me to to say, right, I'm gonna march forward with it now. I think it's it's the engagement with the uh, with local sort of an administration such as the parish council is to start work out the best way of taking it forward. And if funding's available great but we want to put it to the right place and not waste it more questions for roger any more questions for roger yeah okay roger thank you very much indeed uh, can i also take the opportunity to thank avon these trees who are such a fantastic support and uh, tara in particular for setting up this evening's meeting um any last opportunities for questions? Roger, I found it really fascinating because I, every one of these Zoom meetings, I actually learn a lot because I come at it from a completely you know, point of ignorance and I leave feeling as though I'm slightly less ignorant than when I started. So, Roger, thank you very much for that. Thank you for everybody who came. Anything else that, Tari, you want to say in terms of events and activities 
I, I've done my plug. Thank <laughs> but thank you so much, um, Roger. That's really, really interesting to talk. Yes, I enjoyed it. Anything from uh, French the Marden Valley, Robert, that you want to... Uh, just, just to say thank you very much to Roger. I really enjoyed it as well. I'll just copy exactly what Tara said. Excellent. Roger, again, thank you very much. Thanks to everybody who came this evening, and I'm sure we'll see you again for another fascinating Zoom evening.